And Robin, did you send me that photo? I haven't. No, I'm just going to do it right now. This image is one that's really clear. <laughs> Sorry, taking me a minute here. That's all right. Boy. We'll do it. Okay. So we are four of us. Are we expecting um Antonia? Yeah, I haven't heard otherwise. Okay. Um, okay. So I it is Antonia couldn't make it today. Um did, did she say that like the last time? I forget now. Yeah, when we scheduled it, she had some like club meeting that she had to prepare for some visitors oh, or something right. like that. That's right. Yeah, that was Thank today. Yeah. Kayla. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, so we're all here. So it is 6.37 p.m. I am Robin Fordham, chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, opening this December 4th, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Historical Commission. Um, and Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law C30A, Section 18, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by the state legislature on July 14, 2022, and signed into law on July 16, 2022, this public meeting of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing has been posted on the town's online calendar. Okay, um, so first on our agenda this evening is announcements. Um, the only announcement I have is I think uh, Nate sent out, uh, um, or I sent to Nate to send out a announcement of a um, webinar, an hour and a half webinar on um, early 20th century architecture, if anybody's interested in attending. And um, I would love to know if anybody attends any of these um, things that I send around, what they're what their feelings about them are in terms of helping their work on the commission. Does anyone else have any announcements? Hearing none, uh, agenda item two is the review of the FY25 historic CP, historical preservation CPA proposals. I know that, um, is Jenny Barnhall in the, um, participants. I know she uh, was interested in attending the meeting, the Amherst Historical Society's proposal for accessibility and existing condition study was presented and discussed at the CPA meeting last week. Those are the other three that are going to follow. Um, I can... Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a hand raised. Um, Robin, we could... Yep. We'll promote you to um, panelist. Okay. And then... Maybe um, I think I said Ginny. It's Gigi, right? Gigi, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Channeling, oh, no. channeling Simeon Strong. <laughs> yeah, you know the historical society just co-opted my identity. <laughs> Every Zoom meeting I go to, I come in as Simeon Strong, and I don't know how to change it. <laughs> but anyway, I'd be happy to have your questions or explain anything or. You want to just give a really brief recap to um, our commission on the proposal before the CPA committee? Sure. Um, the proposal is certainly for us a high-priced one, but it's clear that we have 
a lot of issues with the Simeon Strong House and the Board of Trustees is a very well-meaning group of volunteers. We know a lot about a lot of different things, but we in no way are qualified to assess what the Simeon Strong House needs to make sure that it's safe and structurally sound um, for the you know decades to come. So we put in for a substantial grant, really for a study, and it'll be under the supervision of uh, Kuhn Riddle Architects, which is very handy because they're right across the street, but they've had good experience with old buildings. And Elon is just a, totally committed to historic preservation and uh, the importance of this project. So there, there are quite a few components. There's several sort of subcontractors who have specific expertise in certain areas like the Conway Company in Springfield is a really good mechanical systems engineer. And we need to have our wiring, plumbing, um, fire alarm systems looked at, assessed, and then it'll be up to us later on to figure out how to pay for upgrades. <laughs> but what we'll get at the end of this um, project is really a well-defined blueprint for how to proceed with the house. And there will be drawings of, um, if we can, we worry about our lack of accessibility. And this is a uh, something that impedes our grant proposals with the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll have drawings to work fun from finally, and perhaps a couple of different um, ideas on that. But um, the other thing we're troubled about or worried about is um, of course the expansion at the Jones Library and its impact on the structure. And so these uh, the computerized scans by my BIM team is, um, I think cutting edge technology that will allow, this is complicated because it's really up to the Jones Library to pay for those scans and we're trying to get it through their trustees. But the technology exists and we can make use of it to do these scans that provide exceedingly detailed, um, basically drawings and they can do a 3D model. but um, they can actually do an overlay of before and after and really tell, has the house sunk? Has the tilt to the west become more tilted? <laughs> um, and these are the kinds of, um, you know, very exact measurements that we need. So that, but if the library agrees to take care of those expenses, we'll of course withdraw it from the proposal and, but we won't know. And CPAC also asked us to apply for the Massachusetts Cultural Council's Cultural Facilities um, Planning Grant process. And we're doing that. Um, I'm pretty well finished with the proposal. We just need to put in some more facts and figures, but, um, you know, if we get a $30,000 grant from them, then that just frees up more CPAC money if they approve the whole package. And I, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, and just for my other, my fellow commissioners, the total ask right now from the Amherst Historical Society is $74,350. And um, yeah, I also uh, strongly, uh, one of my objectives is to get our any CPA uh, historical preservation um, applicant to consider other sources of funding. So delighted that you are doing that. And I strongly encourage you to also apply to the Massachusetts Preservations Project Fund. Um, I said in the CPA committee, I, I'm now currently employed by MHC, so I can't be associated with it in any way, shape, or form. But, um, but I'm aware that they're project deadline for the same funding year, basically starting in July, is I think in 
in March. So March. there's a lot, yeah, a lot of time and they looks like they do fund these same sort of planning grants. Right. And um, it would set, a, your, your effort would send a fabulous precedent <laughs> for other applicants to encourage this kind of outreach where particularly when we see a project going forward that is, you know, you've got these, these planning documents and then you are gonna need to move forward to seek additional construction funds potentially and that sort of thing. Um, and that also, you know, were you to receive a grant somewhere that probably puts you in a, might put you in a better position um, for further funding for them, or it would strengthen, you know, any, any grant proposals from any, um, Absolutely. any organization in the future. So those are my recommendations to um, my fellow commissioners have any other questions. Well, I'll say the only thing with the Massachusetts grant, you have to have sometimes a 50% match. Right. The idea so, being that the CPA would be the 50%. Match. Right. You'd be our match. Right. Yes. Right. You can match uh, the Mass Cultural Council Facilities Fund can be matched with municipal funds. Right. Right. They just so. both use CPA. So, right. Yeah. Which would be great. I, I totally agree with you, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at its many sources of funding. And if we get yeah. the Mass Cultural Council grant, I think that's a good foot in the door. For yep. future funding and yep. it's yep. a kind of a stamp of approval yeah and one yeah. yeah yeah that's very true too and one of my um one of my to-do projects is to pull together a, um, a preservation funding list there's the 1772 foundation too which might be something you would use um when you get to the construction part farther down yeah and those are small they're those small, but you know, dollars. every but ten thousand dollars yeah, that yeah. you don't need to take from a CPA. <laughs> so, um, Pat, yeah. Hattie, Michaela, any questions? Hattie is shaking. No, Pat is saying no. Michaela, any questions? Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you all for taking the time to work for the town like this. It's um very important. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good evening. Okay, you too. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. You can stay in the meeting as an attendee. I'll change your role. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'd love to listen in. I yeah, so I think what's important for the commission is that the the amount of money requested from the CPA committee is uh, quite a bit more than they have available, and so the CPA committee often tries to fund every applicant, whether it's at a reduced amount. And so I think this year they're going to be faced with. Uh, either not funding some projects or, I mean, there's already quite a bit of debt service every year, which, you know, so we oftentimes the CPA committee will borrow against their future funding. And so now we're half a million dollars into the hole every year, um, right. almost 600,000 in debt service, uh, which is borrowed against the future reserves that come in or future CPA funding. So um, I think for the commission later on after we hear these proposals is, you know, possibly making recommendations to the CPA committee, because uh, I think that it might help them, um, you know, with their, when, in their discussion. Right. Yeah. Well, and of course, oh, sorry, I just changed her role to, oh, whoops. <laughs> it just went through. <laughs> Um, I was going to say that um, this question was brought up with um, the the CPA committee, and the answer was generally that, um, uh, and I think there was some, there might have been some public comment, I'm not sure if I'm recalling correctly to um, underscore this, but that um, it would be challenging to break up these assessment reports into multi-year projects because of, first of all, the Jones project going, you know, potentially going forward and the impact of that. And then um, just, you know, you really want to do everything as a package. I think it was one of the architects who said that, um, you know, that you start to look at one thing and you, you really need to have all the, all the um, assessments together. So that's their view, not my words, um, but important to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I actually think that, that it's not a, a large, too large of an ask either. Um, right. Yeah, it's large for for them, but not for right. <laughs> not for Absolutely. CPA. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Any further discussion in that regard? I mean, we're gonna we're just going over the presentations that were presented last week, and then we're gonna actually discuss, I think, all of them in our recommendations. So. Um, I'm going to move on to the Amherst Zion Church of the Nazarene. I sent out, I apologize, quite late, just a drafting of a statement um, 
that I drew up. Um, I think I believe that I, or perhaps, uh, perhaps other CPA committee members, I'm not sure, it's probably only me, um, a question about whether replacing the slate roof uh, of the church was uh, in alignment with the Secretary of the Interior standards, which relate to um, the fact that you should always replace whenever possible a historic material with a historic material. Um, and you should repair uh, when repairs can be done. And um, I think I just sent Nate this picture. Um, we have some documentary evidence, uh, both from the people who inspected the building that suggest that there were different roofs over the lifetime of this building, different roof materials, including wood shingles, um, uh, asphalt shingles and slate. And um, the picture that I, the one picture that I was able to really define it from the early time of the church looks like it might've been a standing seam metal roof. So that allows a uh, lenience in terms of the secretary standards to say, we don't really know what the original historical roof of this building was. Um, the second part of the standards is that um, they're to be applied when economically and technically feasible. And uh, I think we've recognized that e the economic feasibility of a new slate roof is phenomenal, uh, doubles or you know, more than doubles the price. Um, and, um, technical feasibility has to do with the fact that slate roofers are getting to be few and far between. And for as long as the slate roof exists, which I don't know what it's like 50 to hundred years. Is that right, Nate? Yeah, Percent. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. I don't think anyone says beyond a 100, even if they do last that long. Right, right. But at that, you know, you would need somebody who is um, proficient at repairing them. And um, that's getting harder and harder. So, um, so I drew up that, um, statement that I would just like agreement on so that we could make a recommendation, a clear recommendation to the CPC committee that allows the church to go forward with their proposal as an asphalt roof uh, from our uh, recommendation that, that we, we see that that's in alignment with the standards and, um, and the, the, the final piece is that it's fully reversible. So that's another um, um, piece of historic preservation that, um, if you can you can make you you are often given leniency to make a change if you can fully reverse the change and return it to its whatever its historical material was so do you have that picture nate you want to yeah i'll share i think seek young's here if you want to raise your hand you could speak to the proposal and i'll um let's see share my screen All right. All right, that's zoomed in a bit. I'll um, zoom out, but there's the church. Yep, that photo was dated circa 1900. I mean, there's a lamp, a, a lamp there that you know somebody with more technical expertise than I could date, but it's clearly, um, it's clearly not a slate roof. A long time ago. <laughs> the other thing I really like about this picture, if uh, we get to the point where. Um, the church is interested in repainting is that it's pretty clear that it's got a contrast paint job there that might be be revealable through and it's neat as the shutters are closed in this image yeah yep <laughs> back when they used shutters <laughs> <laughs> and so seek young you're a panelist now you could um if you can unmute yourself you're you could You had unmuted yourself. I, I, you know, I bet I could unmute for you. There we go. Okay. Well, I'm here to uh, waiting for the historical commission decision whether uh, will allow us to go with the ash for shingle. Uh, I had a research somewhat very little and limited. Uh, to estimate we have from uh, slave roofers uh, prices outrageous, outrageous because one of the contractors says uh, they will not do a partial repair because amount of work involved 
it might as well do whole roof. Well, we like that, but uh, our budget is very limited. And the other slate roofer, I said that already a couple of weeks ago, uh, he's no longer taking a new job. He's uh, planning on retiring. So it was hard for me to find any slate uh, roofer, that contractor. So, and one of the uh, contractors who, who were helping us notice is the ash for shingles up there right now. So that's why uh, he called the uh, human service who doing a ask for shingle roofer. So we have an estimate. Currently we submit to CPA. It's based on that ask for shingle uh, roof estimate. So total amount that we come up with or we submit was $179,000. And CPA asked uh, that we have any contingency plan. Yes, we are being a church. Uh, we are solely, of course, rely on our uh, congregation uh, contribution. And the worst come worse, we will seek um, Mother Church from New England district or uh, headquarters, which is located in Kansas. Uh, then third contingency plan is I went to bank myself, the local bank where we use. So if a worse come to worse, uh, will they lend us money? They say yes. So that's where we are. And we are hoping to not to go over $179,000. It depends on what kind of decision I get from a historical commission tonight. Thank you. Thanks for being here and thanks for your persistence with this project. <laughs> no, that's the least I could do. <laughs> Thank you all. Sure. Um, so I don't know if you want to maybe just put that statement up, Nate, if we could have a vote on it, like if folks could read it and then vote on it so that while Seek Young is here, we could um, give the project the assurance that we approve of the proposal as it's submitted. You're muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. Words, words that it needed to do an update and it's not responding right now. So oh, okay. I, I think, I, I, think I, I think I can get it in a second. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Love it when that happens. <laughs> Oh, I haven't. I, I'm afraid to update my computer right now. Zoom needs an update, but every time I log on for a meeting and I just haven't just sat down to, and done it, I didn't want to do it yeah. before. Yeah, um, well, and for Michaela's benefit, um, the Amherst Zion Church uh, occupies what is historically known as the North Amherst Congregational Church, which is uh, a contributing building in um, the North Amherst Historic District. I don't know the exact name of the building. Um, so it is therefore on the National Register and on the State Register. Um, it has sort of a twin in South Amherst. You have these two um, Federalist style, incredibly similar churches. Um, they came last year uh, with a proposal. I think at that point they were considering the slate roof um, and there was a uh, a desire for more clarity about their proposal. And so um, their proposal was tabled and eventually expired um, because uh, time just kind of rolled around. And so they're here again, they've clarified their proposal um, and targeted this asphalt roof. Um, they have some water leakage. If you go in, and I've been, I was fortunate to have them allow me to do a study of their church as part of my coursework. And um, it's pretty apparent the the damage um, that has the potential to um, cause more damage, more cost over time and put the building at risk. So um, that's basically why they're before us. And um, we can, we will we'll go into discussion about our support for this and the dollar amount, but um, that's the basic, the basics of it. Thank you. Yeah. It's very near my house. So I see it every uh -huh. day. Oh, you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was also going to say that going to an asphalt roof and removing the old layers uh, would reduce the weight. And so they have some broken, you know, it's, um, it's kind of like a hybrid style construction with um, kind of timber frame, but also yep. some modern, you know, it's kind of that mix. Um, and there's some broken uh, purlins and other things. And so they're going to fix that, but having a lighter roof would actually help preserve the structure, which is part of the CPA um, piece. 
And so you want me to share, Nate, if you're still. Uh, I, I have you got that. Got it? Okay. You got visible. it. Right. Yep. Let me just. Um, there we go. I'll zoom in a little bit and. Uh, Yeah, and I think it was important for the commission if we, uh, I'll give you, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I think the CPA committee would would uh, welcome the guidance on this project. So if we, you know, agree to this statement and Robin can pass it on to the CPA committee, you know, then there's no question of whether or not it's appropriate to replace the roof material. And they're not really, you know, the CPA committee isn't left questioning it. It's really then more about what, you know, fun, the funding level of the project. Mm -hmm. Maybe just one if people want to put their hands up when they've read it, we can continue. Well, that was done. That's done. Waiting on you, Hetty. <laughs> I'm up. I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> Just I, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Find so, my icons. <laughs> for the uh, in the interest of uh, of uh, efficiency, um, does anybody have any objection to this statement? No. Okay. None from Pat. No. Okay. So um, I learned this in another meeting recently. The chair will entertain a motion to uh, <laughs> affirm the statement proposed by Chair Robin Porto in support of- So moved. Uh, okay, <laughs> how do you so moved? I need a second. Pat, second. Second. Okay, then we'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Pat? In favor. Uh, Hetty? Aye. Michaela? Yes. Aye, and I vote aye. Okay. Thanks, folks. Uh, I trust that will put the church and the CPA committee's minds at ease. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see that um, you've still got Su Kyung in the panel. Yes. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> assuming, I'm assuming we don't need further comment. Are we good, Nate? Sure, yeah, I'll um, make you uh, um, an attendee again and thank you again and hilda's had her hand raised on and off robin yeah um do we how do we we tend to wait with public comment till the end um but it's your call nate i don't oh as chair you can i mean i was thinking we'd at least try to get through that presentation and then we could um allow hilda the chance yeah to she has, i guess if she has a question and there's a comment specifically about it that would be fine all right Hilda, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, so I wanted to ask, while you were still on that section before you took the vote, that building uh, makes me cry every time I drive by because there's so much deterioration. Are they planning on fixing anything else, like the rotten wood on the facade before even painting the building? Is any of that being considered? Um I mean, I would say that um, just again, for reasons of efficiency and what we have before us, um, that you can certainly engage with the with uh, Si Kyung and the church regarding what their future plans are. We're just trying to stay focused on the roof right now, especially considering how much time we've spent um, getting them through the process. Um, I mean, I know that, that when they came before the CPA committee last year, they certainly had, uh, we all had discussions about um, what was next in line in terms of what might need repair and what they might return to CPA for, but I can't speak for them at this point. And it's not really um, that kind of, I think it's not really that kind of a discussion right now, but um, but your your comments are, are recognized and, and uh, a valid concern. Yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I was oh, yeah. part, of the, as part of the roof project, they're gonna fix some of the fascia and the trim. So if you look along the roof line, there is some damage and rot, they'll fix that. but. 
you know, repainting the whole church um, that had been part of the consideration last year or was questioned, but it's some of it's a matter of cost and then, you know, phasing. So um, what town had asked for was a phasing plan. And so I think right now it's really about getting the roof and certain aspects, some rot fixed and stabilizing the structure and then, you know, proceeding with a, an approach uh, after that. Thank you. Thanks, Hilda. Yeah, I mean, the neighbors are all concerned and it's heartbreaking to see what's happened over 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're ready to move on to our next uh, agenda item, which is 2C, and that is the District 1 Neighborhood Association, um, the Mill River History Trail Project. Um, that is a uh, project associated with uh, further research of additional sites along the Mill River History Trail. Um, and their intention is also to do some um, so website, website work, but that would not be funded by CPA funds because that's uh, outside the area of um, eligibility. And I think the important thing for our commission to know is that any of the information that they uh, uncover as part of this archival research is definitely um, material that can be applied to either Form Bs, building forms, or Form A area forms. So it meets a really specific um, uh, um, responsibility of the local historic commission, which is to keep the macros inventory up to date. So um, that's one one reason in particular to provide it with support. Um, and their ask was for um, mm -mm, forty six thousand eight hundred and seventy five dollars. Um, I don't have notes in front of me. I'm trying to remember. I think our uh, <laughs> our um, Hattie can chime in here, but our um, conversation about this project got a little bit off track, talking about you know what the trail will be used for in terms of recreation and what kind of signage will it have, and um, uh, it would be good just to focus back on this particular proposal, which is just for archival research. It's with the intent of creating a trail, but um, the archival research does serve a particular uh, inventory purpose. And so uh, I think that's what makes it a particularly strong proposal. Did you have any other comment, Hetty? Um, I don't think so. Um, it's, it's just really an extension of what's been done already, um, widening the number of sites that are needing, you know, research that goes a bit deeper so that we can kind of connect the dots really. Um, and actually the North Church in Amherst is one of the sites. Yep, and I think the and the North Church is also, I think, in need of a, a Form B update. So that's something to keep in mind. Did you have any comments, Nate? No, I mean, we talked about it, I think, was it just last month or the month before, or it was more of a, a blurring a together. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay, yep. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so the um, next project that was presented was um, M Michael and Kimberly Como, uh, a historic house move uh, project in the West Side Historic District, that's 260 um, Northampton Road. And um, a lot of questions around this one. Uh, I would say that uh, my comments to the CPA committee were, um, I was kind of struggling to pull together my ideas around um, when we fund um, when we fund private property owners with CPA funds, which uh, we've determined is allowable. Um, there are a bunch of questions that go with that. And in past years, we funded the Hills House, the, the Women's Club. Um, we approved funding, which I don't know if has been adopted by um, the Salem Place, uh, we the Conky Stevens House. Um, this being a single private homeowner, um, just, it just brings us into new territory. And um, I was kind of trying to pull together my thoughts. The first big question, and I don't know if Nate has an update on this, or not, but um, just looking for my notes here. Um, 
there was a question as to whether the applicant would accept a preservation restriction. And it was clarified that preservation restriction, it doesn't have to be in perpetuity, but it is a requirement in terms of CPA funding. And Nate is shaking his head <laughs> for it. Is that, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it may be a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Do you want to talk about that at all? I mean, my understanding is that, it, you know, the language is that it is a requirement when town uh, takes an interest in a property. And this is, I think, a $90,000 ask um, so that, you know, the town invests a certain amount of money in a piece of property. And so what is the town's return on it? And the preservation restriction allows for that property to maintain its historical integrity over the term of the restriction, whether it's in perpetuity or for a limited period of time. So that helps guarantee the, guarantee the idea that like, you know, that the applicant, you know, couldn't come the following year and, you know, request demolition uh, of all or part of the house and really alter its structure. Um, but maybe you want to talk specifically more, Nate, about whether or not that is a requirement. I mean, I kind of, in our meeting last week, um, I, I asked Dave and, and because there was uncertainty on the part of the property owner. And it, there are a lot of other questions that follow whether we're going to put in a preservation restriction. And so I don't know exactly how to go forward from there, but um, go ahead and speak to that. Yeah, the owner can't they can't attend tonight that we had, had an email exchange. Uh, they said they'd be willing to enter in, you know, into a restriction. They just would need more detail. And so the CPA language around historic preservation says when the, you know, there's a, in, um, uh, when the, I think it says when the town acquires property. And so it's a little different than um, some of the other categories, open space or others. And so, a lot of communities don't require a preservation restriction for historic preservation projects unless they're actually purchasing property for historic preservation. So Northampton doesn't really have them. Um, you know, some communities read the, uh, you know, interpret the statute differently. And so I think it's really a local decision. You know, we had talked about this, I don't know, in the last year, the commission has about not having a permanent restriction, but having, you know, a 30 year or a 50 year and having it be a local restriction uh, between the town and, you know, the commission and the, and the entity, I think that's appropriate. Um, I've asked our, the town attorney to look into it a, a bit ago. And so, you know, part of the, part of having a restriction, whether or not it's actually required by statute is that it would, you know, help secure and derive the, the public benefit. So some of it is, okay, we're giving public funds to a private entity. What is the public benefit? And so, you know, with the you know Salem Place with Ithmar Conkey House, you could say that the public benefit is it's individually listed in the National Register, its style, its location on Main Street, just even maintaining it as um, you know a visible structure on Main Street that could be enough public benefit given the you know the nature and architecture of the house. And for others, it may be that there's some other attributes, right? It's first yeah that we have to determine it's, it's uh, historically significant to the town. And what is that? Is it, you know, for certain structures, is it, you know, um, it's architectural style relationship to um, a view shed or to, a, you know, a culture, you know, of the town or political, the, say the things we use in the, in the demolition review. Um, and so I think a preservation restriction for most projects is necessary. Um, this being one of them, I think the, the strong house, for instance, if we're doing studies or even the North, um, you know, we just mentioned the, the research for the trail to me, a restriction is not necessary. And I think it's, you know, the idea is that we're even for East Amherst, you know, one of the other CPA, um, proposals is money to study properties and document them with, um, you know, new form B's for up to 40 or 50 properties. And I don't, you know, there's no restriction there. Right. But the idea is that we're the public benefit is we're getting research made available through form B's or reports that could be, you know, that is going to be linked in Macris and online and it could be in the Jones Library. And so um, for this project on Northampton Road, they're asking to move the house and a restriction would be, you know, I, I think a restriction would be appropriate. And some of it would also be to then, as Robin said, you know, we'd have guidelines. We could allow changes to the structure, but it would want to be reviewed by the commission. They couldn't, you know, put an addition on and change the, it's an Italianate house, you know, next year, you know, put a big addition on and all of a sudden it's no longer what it is and, or tear it down or something. And so 
right um, right um yeah. yeah so um so that's if that so given that you've gotten some communication that the um that the applicant is you know not is is willing to engage in uh, a preservation restriction you know after some discussion um in terms of this house and recommendations to the committee um I went through my thinking and you know came up with the fact that it I think it passes the significant test significance test because it is uh, part of this uh, national register district so it's on the national register that's pretty much um, <laughs> that's pretty much significance right there um, it has architectural significance as I think it's the uh, most southern well I'm not sure in the um, national register district it sort of talks about how it's this it's this oddly situated Italianate house um, if you drive by it um, once I realized which house it was, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I know that house because it has these really substantial overhanging eaves. Um, public interest test, it's a little bit different in the sense that it's in a little bit busier part of town, but it really is one of the house, first houses that you see that sort of signals that you're entering a historic area. Um, and then the next questions I had, and, you know, these are somewhat more for the CPA committee, but I wanted to talk about them in front of the commission is, is the idea, especially in this year where funds are tight, um, what is the urgency? So essentially what happens if we do nothing? And what is the financial need of the homeowner? Because the entities that have come before us have been faced with either just no funds to make historically sensitive repairs or um, historically, the sensitive repairs being so much more expensive than I think in the case of the Kanki Stevens house, you know, was really within the budgets of their homeowners. Um, this is a homeowner whose foundation in their historic house is failing, um, but I don't really, I'm not really clear at what rate it's failing and whether this could stand to be kicked down the, kicked down the road another year. Um, and what sort of, you know, they did address, you know, that they're strapped for resources, just as, you know, most people are that, um, you know, they might be able to get a loan to cover it. But, um, and then um, I just wanted to float this and I'll do so at the CPA uh, meeting this week, um, whether this particular property might introduce the idea. And I don't know if any other CPA committee does something like this, but um, to provide the funds as a no interest loan due upon a uh, sale of the home. That would be, in my mind, sort of a kind of halfway, um, allowing for the relocation um, of the home to go forward um, with the return of CPA funds. So those are just all ideas I had. They are talking about relocating it, um, which, I mean, when I first read the proposal, I just thought like, oh, this is a homeowner's issue. And then when I asked the question about, um, because they talked about interference from traffic, the house is at risk from traffic on Route 9. And I said, well, you know, any, any house is at risk for traffic on Route 9. And they listed three out of the four incidents they've had where cars have, one car actually did directly hit the house and two others um, have made it too close for comfort. And um, I guess that's a question for the commission whether, Re, it's not a relocation that moves it to a different lot. So you wouldn't be talking about issues of uh, necessarily affecting the integrity by shifting its position. Um, and um, I don't know if the relocation would pivot the front facade, which faces not to Northampton Road at this point. Um, if it would be facing the road, which would be sort of an added public benefit to allow the, the face of the building, but that's something I'm not clear on. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions uh, or comments, I'd be happy to discuss them, especially considering that I'm gonna need to be arguing for this or uh, project one way or the other, um, probably on Thursday. <laughs> so um, this is one of the less straightforward projects that we have and Nate, I welcome any comments from you too. I mean, it's it's interesting that it's almost to the border of Amherst and Hadley. I mean, it, the historic map that um, 
you just shared with the commissioners, Robin, um, you know, makes that very clear. So we have that building on one side of Amherst and we have the Conkley Stevens house in another historic district on the east side of Amherst. And um, I think the, the house on Northampton Road is about 1870. I can't remember what the date is on the Conkley Stevens house, um, but I think it's earlier and I know it's part of the East Village historic district. So these are both places where people are sort of coming into town and and as you say, these, these buildings sort of signal that you're entering Amherst and that you're entering a, a historic town um, that cares about its um, historic resources. Um, and so, you know, I'm very intrigued that it's a, an Italianate style house. Um, Italianate um, houses in the Pioneer Valley are a very interesting phenomenon in and of themselves. Um, in this case, what's interesting is that it's a, a, a the family who live in the house from the early on period are quite modest in terms of their occupation. Um, so that that intrigues me um, to find out more about that and, uh, you know, what their story is and how they came to Amherst and, you know, who they are. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, um, the quick a lot. deed research that I was able to do has, um, you know, lines up with what's in the um, National Register nomination that it was a um, John McCarty or McCarthy. It looks like he's McCarty and then he later becomes McCarthy. Um, and then it's handed down uh, when he's listed owning the house. This woman, Mary Bowler, is actually his niece. I think she becomes part of the family. She ends up owning it at a certain point. Um, and um, he was listed, I think, in the, let's see, in the 1880 census. He's a farmer and his kids are at school and his wife is keeping house. And in 1900, he becomes a day laborer. And I think his daughters start working in like the hat factory. So, I mean, this, you know, and it, then they were both, both uh, John and his wife, Ellen were born in Ireland and they're buried in Hadley, I think because they were Catholic. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, more to the point, I mean, cur I'd be curious what you think about um, the idea mm -hmm. of a, of you know what the financial need is of the homeowner Nate um we haven't really come up with you know with this before and yeah Pat has our hand raised um oh, I was going to okay, say that sorry. they are proposing to move the house you know into the property quite a bit it's a larger property um and so you know its relationship on the streetscape will change quite a bit um the uh Let's see. So here, here it is coming up Northampton Road on Google Street View. That this tree is no longer there, but the um, you know, the new sidewalk. You know, the the road was widened, so you know, it's the road edge is much closer to the house. But what they're hoping to do is move it back. You know, quite a bit. So here, the house is located right here. Is to move it back quite a bit from the road, and it came before the historical commission. I think it was three years ago. And the commission debated, and it was only it was for a demolition permit. And um, the commission at the time said, "Well, you know, it's really won't be. It's not really a demolition, in the in the sense of it is if you're preserving the house and putting it on a new foundation." And so there are discussions about, well, would the new foundation should it be match the existing in terms of material or outward appearance, and do, what is the historic integrity of the house if it is moved on the site? And they, they actually didn't really answer that. And they said, well, in terms of just the demolition piece, this could happen. Um, and then, you know, it's been a little bit of time with the pandemic and everything. And now the owners are back. I think it, <clears throat> if this were to be recommended, I think the commission would want to be, you know, clear in why it's important because um, I just had an email today from another homeowner who's like, I live in a really old house and somewhere and I want money to fix it. And I've had a number of calls over the last year I'm like, oh, I live on Lincoln Ave. I'd like to fix my house. And it's like, well, um, you know, CPA money is available, but it's not just because it's an old house. It has to have, you know, some historic significance and really a public benefit, I think. So 
uh, I think it gets tricky. And at some point, the commission might have to be, you know, pretty judicious in how it recommends funding, even if it's eligible, just the fact that there's competing interests. And so how, you know, whether or not this is eligible, how does it fall um, in the ranking of the historic preservation projects and then in the CPA overall? Um, you know, uh, I think the homeowners, you know, haven't, uh, often the CPA committee asks if you could have a match or what is the, you know, what kind of contributing funds or how could you leverage this? That's something to consider. Um, I do think it's, yeah, I mean, I think for some reasons it's as heady as you mentioned in Robin, there's reasons why this could be important to fund. I do think that moving it off the road and actually having it almost not be visible if you're coming up on Northampton Road might change it a little bit. Um, well, certainly if we were to, I mean, it's pretty open space there. I don't know. I'd be curious to get a, a rendering of, um, you know, kind of how much you would see. Because if it, if it were something that were to disappear into the woods, I would be less likely <laughs> to to recommend it. And, you know, that would be a, really a basis for, um, for establishing one way or the other, for me at least. I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I'll just do a quick share and then I guess, Pat, you could. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Pat. We're not, yeah, not to coming, worry. Coming, coming up the street, I think the, the property is pretty open. So even if it's set back, it's probably visible. It's just, you know, it's not the same as um, where it's located now. Oh, sorry, Pat, if you want to speak. I... Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Sure, sure. No, I just, I had a couple of thoughts. And one was, I was wanting to clarify that, that they came before us a few years ago, I think pre-pandemic. Um, and I remember going out and checking to see what the foundation was made of. And we'd question whether it had to be the same or not, et cetera. Um, and then nothing happened because I passed that way quite often. Um, but I, I, I agree with the pondering of moving it back and to what extent it maintains this streetscape. Um, but also, Robin, I was a little intrigued with your thought of a, a no interest loan to be paid es essentially a lien on the property yeah, yeah. when yeah, it's and sold. Then, yeah. And and it, it, has the town lawyer then posed this question and weighed in on it? No, I mean, this was just something that I would say occurred to me as it was part of my work in the city of Greenfield. I worked on their housing rehab program where, you know, people are just having, you know, roofs or porches replaced or whatever. And there, you know, you enter into agreement with the city. It all depends. Um, sometimes it's, you know, fully repayable. Sometimes there's a gradual, uh, depending on the funding year, there's a gradual um, um, forgiveness of the loan. You know, you might give someone a loan of $15,000 if they own it for long enough eventually. The debt disappears and it's forgiven. Um, but yeah. in this case, I would say see, see it as more like a, you know, maybe a match or something like that. I mean, it was something that the it it would not be. I don't think that it would be something that we could achieve in this funding round. I don't think there's the time for you know the appropriate um, uh, consideration of, of applying that. But I would like to. I don't. I don't get the sense, as you said, you know, they came before us a while ago to move the house. It's clearly not super urgent. Um, when asked what they would do if they weren't funded, they said they'd just, you know, keep keep working on, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to collapse at any moment. <laughs> so right, right, and it just, you just, um, that that was part of the question, you know, how urgent is this? And yeah. here they are several, I'm going to say three years later, yeah. um, about approximately. Um, and, and in the meantime, they built that other outbuilding on the, uh, on the hill, um, and so I, I guess, you, you know, and my recollection is when they first came to us, it was because the foundation was failing and the, now the, the reasoning for moving it is, it sounds different than it did then. Um, I think that's still basically the same. The is same. It? Okay. They added, they added the, the threat to, you know, sort of in a preservation argument, they added the threat to, of, of these traffic and incidents that they've had and they're even closer to the street now that the street it's been widened has gone through. Right. and um yeah when they like I said when they provided those examples I I gave that argument more credence <laughs> <laughs> okay just fine I was just looking for clarification and, and I I think the idea of 
in, in an instance like this of essentially putting a lien on, maybe having a progressive um, forgiveness over time, but um, I think, you know, with funds so limited that there are projects that are more specifically, um, in my opinion, more specifically preservation projects. Mm -hmm. And and this is in, in its own way, but it's not entirely. Right. It's not as, it's not as direct and strong. Right. Yeah. So just sharing my thoughts. Thank you. Michaela, did you have any comments? No, I just, I agree with what Pat was saying at the end where it's, it's hard because I feel like everybody puts a lot of work into their submissions, their requests, but we have like a limited ability of what we can accomplish. Right. Um, so I, I agree with the overall seems like consensus that this seems like a, a lower priority request unfortunately yep. as a yeah, request, uh, it, it it does speak to the idea of having have having a revolving fund in amos at some point that would be able to address private homeowners requests especially in historic districts you know which this house is so you know as robin said it it should count for something um, and maybe there just needs to be a, a step back from this particular property re or an owner's request to some to a conversation about Amherst having a, a revolving fund that could be administered, maybe not by the town, but by the Amherst Historical Society or some other kind of entity, a Friends of Amherst Preservation, perhaps. Um, or even you know even CPA with a yeah. you know with a repayment requirement. Yeah, I was gonna say, Robin, if this were to move forward, I don't. I think yeah, for housing, we often do a you know deferred payment loan. You know, it could be written off one thirtieth a year over thirty years. So if they sell it in year fifteen, they pay back a fifteen you know one fifty you know whatever half of the amount. Um, right. I think that could happen pretty quickly if that were to happen. You know, move, if this were recommended by CPA. So okay. I, don't, I don't, I don't, I think that, right, we off, we do it with housing, um, um, housing loans or housing grants, we'll do a no, in a deferred payment loan or something pretty regularly. So, so um, can you, um, can I just make a request that maybe you float that somehow to whoever's going to be in attendance on Thursday? So I'm not explaining it, you know, out of the blue. Yeah, I'll talk to Dave and maybe I can email Holly and then that can go okay. to the CPA committee. Yeah, just so there's some, pro I mean, so that they know what I'm talking about. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think that um, we're at the end kind of of the CPA presentations or discussions. I think the committee, often the commission will write to the CPA committee with, you know, with some guidance. And I think I was going to yeah, share my screen. Our next agenda item, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I have... Um, Oh, great. What yeah, what is what's visible? I'm seeing a few things on my screen right now. Is it the uh What's the proposals the of... and their amounts? Yeah. All right, yeah. So I was gonna suggest that we go uh from high dollar figure down <laughs> since you know the smaller the smaller um grants are a little easier to they're not as quite as hard to say no to. Did someone um, remind me of the total amount that it's like allotted for the year, yeah, from CPA. Um, yep. So um, we'll go back here. Uh, sorry, I, I lost it. I was. Um, Is it like, I mean, I have in my spreadsheet, like a, a you know, I mean, totally ballpark one one million seven hundred thousand. Is that yeah, here? It is. Sorry, I, I was jumping around the meeting right. package. Yeah. Um, so if you, um, I guess the important thing is down here. So yeah. they have 520,000 in debt service. Uh, there's some reserves that have been set aside for housing. And so what this says is if we have, if we uh, available after meeting debt obligation is 1.54 million. If committee decided to use reserves, you know, there's 1.7. Uh, the total project um, requested less debt service is almost two and a half million. So the shortfall is seven hundred fifty thousand. 
Yep. Then the um, so, historic preservation asks are five hundred and sixty-seven thousand. Yeah, and so what's here um, in yellow, or I don't know if it's orange, uh, is debt service, and so you know shows you what year they're in. So you know some will be falling off, some are just starting, but you know, for instance, if the town says, "Oh yeah, let's fund." A few other projects and it adds to the debt service you know next year this number could be you know six hundred and fifty thousand, and so it just you know i think it's really um i think it's great that we can the town can borrow um i think it should be you know the problem is um it go you know it it takes away from future requests and so usually it's typically reserved for really high high priority projects or ones that have a larger budget and so you know, for me, it'd be really silly to say, let's, let's bond a hundred thousand dollars for some project. Right. It should, you know, um, and that's not, you know, the CPA committee will have to decide that, but maybe the commission itself could say, oh, well, there's two historic preservation projects that maybe could have a reduced amount or aren't as high of a priority. So the, um, I'll go back to that screen that was on. Okay. So the highest ask is for the Amherst Zion Church roof repairs, and that does not include, I mean, so you can address this, it does not include a contingency if like prices come in higher because the estimates were um, were brought in before. Um, if things weren't quite so tight, it would be the sort of thing, and I still might suggest it that, you know, we build in a contingency, which just means that um, these funds are not given to the organization, they have to pay for it and ask for reimbursement. So if the project comes in under budget, the money goes back into CPA. It's not like it's lost. Um, but um, I am hesitant to recommend anything but a dollar less. And, and given the importance of that building and the persistence of the applicant and the state of the roof, um, the other, I would say the other deterioration, I don't think poses as nearly as much of a threat to the actual building over time right now as this project. And um, so my recommendation to the committee would be that this be really be the first priority on this list. The, um, I will say mm -hmm. that, um, sorry to jump in quickly, but last year when they came forward, the CPA committee had put about 165,000 in reserve for this project based on some, you know, some estimates that the church had uh, at the time for maybe doing partial repairs or something. And so, you know, it's been a year, they've worked with town staff, they've worked, met with different contractors to get quotes. And so really they followed through with what we, we had, you know, the CPA committee in the town had asked them. And so, uh, you know, right, right. What they have now is a, a pretty accurate estimate for the work. They have worked with Q-Riddle to develop plans and um you know they really followed through with everything that yep. was laid out for them yep. so is one hundred and sixty five thousand dollars in reserve that would be the the difference would be new money ask no so what happened was if the money could have been allocated last fiscal year uh then it could have but the money basically is part of the existing um Okay. Not now. So really it'd be a yeah. whole new FY25 allocation. Thank you, Nate. So is there any objection to putting this first on our no. list of recommendations and a... giving it strong support? No, I think it's a good idea. It's a it's a um very important. Yeah, I, I agree with that being first. Um, Nate, maybe you want to talk to us now about the uh, cemeteries and what kind of negotiated funding could go forward there. So we have a $150,000 proposal right now. Yeah, I mean, I you always, you know, like you don't want to say you could take less money, but we would accept less money as the town. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it, you know, I think uh, one of the CPA committee, one of the follow questions was what's the right number? And, you know, I think it can fluctuate. So, you know, we were trying to target, you know, over a hundred stones and monuments in both cemeteries that could be reduced, right? I mean, some of it was, um, 
we don't have, a, you know, um, PDPC had look, went out there a while ago, town staff looks at it and we think that, yeah, there's more than a hundred that could be um, preserved, but, you know, we could prioritize that. So, you know, I don't know what, you know, is 120,000 the right number or something, 110, I mean, there's, it could be a reduced amount. Okay. Well, is there any number that we would consider so low that it would defeat the purpose? I mean, you know. If we halved it, would it would it still make a difference that the some work could be done on both of those cemeteries in terms of restoration of gravestones? Yeah, I mean, I think. So I was just um, let me get my calculator. Yeah. Um, some of it is just, uh, I guess, I mean, I would say maybe, you know, so yeah. Well, it's hard somewhere to hear, I guess. Somewhere that, that, yes. <laughs> um, somewhere in that range. Well, I was trying to think that, you know, what if we were to bid this, you know, what's the, sometimes right. there's an economies of scale. So if it's, you know, if they're only doing 30 stones in a cemetery, it might actually cost more. Yep. You have okay. to come up and mobilize. Because you know the preservation treatment is they come up and they clean the stones, um, you know, number of times, and so they'll be you know whatever company will come to Amherst likely have to be here you know four to six times, and so if we were trying to say okay let's do seventy five stones in a cemetery, uh, and you know if we use the estimate from or the per stone cost now it's about sixty thousand that's not accounting for fixing larger stones or monuments. And so to me, you know, 80,000 is probably as low as I'd want to go. Just Okay. Good to know. I'm not trying to diminish yeah. the importance of the project because grave, right. graveyards and, are really important <laughs> for historic. And then um, on top of that, one was removing the fence and putting in granite markers. And so that might be a $20,000. So, I mean, you know, if we really needed to, could we say we're not going to do the fences? We tried this two years ago and it was uh, the CPA committee said, well, fixing the chain link fence in North Cemetery is not historic preservation. But the idea of removing it and actually putting in greater markers is probably what was there. It was documented in South Cemetery. Um, I mean, I would say 100,000 would be, you know, would be probably better than 80, but. Um, okay. Um, and right. but essentially, the the removing the fences and putting in granite markers is something that doesn't have an urgency factor. So that could be, right. you know, kind of bumped for a year or two if need be. Right. Okay. Right. And that's about twenty of it. Uh, I forgot how we. So like eighty eighty thousand for gravestones alone is kind of our lowest hope, right? <laughs> well, yeah. If we was right, if it was allocated eighty thousand, that would hopefully achieve, you know, around 75 stones in each cemetery, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other comments on that? I'd rather see the 100,000 if we could get it just so we can, um, to do the best job, but to exclude the fence. Okay. I think if I remember correctly, part of the discussion about the fence is that it, it unless we re replace it with the granite stones or markers, um, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with historic preservation. And that the fence, the fence should be the responsibility of the town from another budget. So I'd rather just focus on the gravestones. Yep. I'm with you, Pat. Me too. Okay. Um, the historic house move. Um, I would say that my feeling at this point is uh, uh, to have a robust discussion with the CPA committee about the urgency of this project and to consider some way to fund it that includes um, you know, a lien or a forgiveness loan or something like that to really take time to uh, explore it and so defer, probably defer for 
another year. I mean, if it needs, uh, yeah, it, it's it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting, I think it's, it's going to be the hardest discussion that we're going to have. <laughs> um, so curious, anybody's input there, if there's anything that they particularly want me to represent on Thursday. I think it just represent our current discussion tonight, Rob. Okay. Yeah, I think the urgency question and then the deferred payment loan on the DPL is a good um, things to discuss. I, okay. Yeah. And I'm going to assume we're all in agreement that it, it does really meet the uh, significance factor and provided that the relocation, that it's interchangeable provided the relocation mm -hmm. doesn't um, diminish the streetscapes to such a point that it really isn't a public benefit anymore. Right, correct. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Amherst Historical Society Accessibility and Existing Conditions Study. Um, I am in favor of this, full, fully funding this. I think it's important. Um, I think given the Jones Library Project, it really needs to move forward. Um, and I am hopeful that between uh, the two funding projects uh, that um, I know Gigi said that they would be applying to Mass Cultural Council and that maybe they will apply to um, the preservation funds that some of that some of that money might be returned uh, in the form of or you know uh, not returned but uh, reduced if they can get funding from another arm um, so that my recommendation would be to fully fund um, again with a strong recommendation for them to continue to pursue outside funding, which they seem interested in, which I'm pleased about, because I think they're really going to need to do that in order to um, put through any of the changes that come up through <laughs> through these reports. I agree, Robin. Fully funded. Okay. Pat? Yeah, I, I also agree. And Michaela? Okay, she's shaking her head. <laughs> the up and down direction. <laughs> okay. Um, Mill River History Trail. Um, they've done uh, a great job with their first round of funding. Um, it's going to um, provide important uh, documentation for inventory, um, potential inventory updates. And um, I don't see, I think it would be a, a it would be challenging if they were challenging to the momentum of the project to not have this section move forward. It's not uh, an easy project for them to get funding elsewhere from. So in that regard, I would suggest fully funding. I would agree with that. They've, they've had, a, had a remarkable start and I think it's significant information for the town and the history of the town. Yeah, I agree too. Okay. Okay, so that's a fully fund recommendation. And then the East Amherst Local Historic District. Uh, so this is a help me along here, Nate. This is not this is like a form. I'm I get I'm it's mm, <laughs> is it a formal survey? I get, I get confused in this area between our expansion that's going underway with TVPC and what this um, this uh, right, that's right this is this is a survey with the intention of creating a new local historic district. Yeah, so I think what this money would be for is to actually complete uh, and update you know new inventory forms for you know forty or fifty properties, and then also so the um, a member or two of the uh, local historic district commission reached out to Chris Skelly. He had been a he had been an employee at Mass um, Mass Historic. He's a resident of Western Mass, and he's now a consultant. And they reached out, and he provided this estimate in terms of not only doing the research on the properties, but then also going through and helping prepare a study report and other documents to then apply to Mass Historic for a new local historic district. So. Um, you know, the 20,000 was his estimate for all of that. I do think that, you know, if it's 50 properties and the rate per property in terms of doing it, 20,000 is still not a lot um, to research, how, you know, and generate, um, enough, you know, 50 inventory forms and a report. 
uh, you know, we can't sole source, we can't sole source it for this amount. So the town would have to put out a request for quotes and select the lowest um, bidder. But, you know, with qualifications and identifying a minimum number of properties, I'm assuming larger firms, you know, may not have a lower price because of overhead and other factors, you know, and um, travel. So, you know, I think there's the, the point made to the CPA committee was that, right, kind of like North Amherst or the Mill River History Trail is that we'll have new research on properties. And that's kind of the historic piece. Um, it's not really an endorsement of a local historic district in East Amherst. It's really about gathering this history and making it public. Uh, so I, you know, if that's a question or a concern for the historical commission. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an added piece that um, for the documentation um, that there is development pressure in the town of Amherst and that uh, if one wants to proceed with historically sensitive development, um, having documentation like this in a, um, you know, in what is what was the original part of the town is, is pretty important. I mean, we... Um, we do have, you know, we're seeing a lot of changes in that area. Um, and I am not at all saying change is bad, um, but planned change is better than unplanned change. <laughs> um, so in that sense, I mean, I'm just, just trying to think of the urgency of this. I mean, you could, it's a small ask, you know, it could wait another year, but um, as the years go by, um, you know, we, I think we all know what pretty much every town in America is under pressure to provide more housing. And so this was a good argument for the urgency of just that, that it's just that, you know, we, this will help us plan appropriately. Yeah, I was gonna argue that the commission has been studying this for a bit and, you know, knowing that it could take a year to get the district in place, you know, the urgency would be if it was delayed a year, it could actually be, you know, two and a half years before yep. some protections were, were um, in place, so. So my recommendation would be fully funding in that regard. I think so uh, too. It seems like yeah. a good benefit for costs for this project. Yeah, I I agree with the funding. Me too. Okay. okay. Um Do we have anybody who's got their hand up for public comment? Maybe. There's only two members in the audience right now. So. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure that those are. That's a big. That's a big item that we just got done. Um, okay. Yeah, I, can, I can email that 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 word document out to everyone too, Robin. You can have it. Okay, great, excellent. Thank you, um, and thank you for taking those notes. I appreciate it. Um, agenda item four is discussion of one and five year goals, which I am going to defer to our next meeting. <laughs> well, actually, no, maybe I won't because I don't know if we have, I don't know if anyone else has more preservation plan comments than um, the, our last round. I have not sent you guys the survey that I intended to, although I did development. So I don't have survey results to present. Um, I sent my comments to Nate. Uh, I think maybe Hetty did too. Um, do you have any? Uh, town feedback for us on that right now. I'd still, um, Hedy, if you, I don't know if I saw an email from you, but if, if I missed it, please. I'm going to send it again, Nate. Yeah. Um, I, saw, I did see an email today, but not. Um, no, I also sent good. the video, um, a link to the previous meeting to PVPC, and it said, you know, at starting at, you know, 39 minutes or whatever. Okay. Um, uh, you can watch the discussion we had about the preservation plan. So, you know, I, Rob, and I, you know, I think you provided comments. I mean, I know you provided comments and it was good to have. So, yeah, I, um, what we could do is ask that they come back at the next meeting to provide an update. I mean, we can extend the contract. They're probably eager to get it done. It's been, you know, it's been taking a little bit of time, but to me, I think it'd be important just to make sure we, the commission reviews the next draft. Agreed. Yep, any other comment on that item? No, okay. Nate, did I send you my edits? No, so I, I just searched in my inbox and I have, um, I did not see it in the last. Okay, 
I'm going to get it to you now. <laughs> That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Um, next item is macros inventory. I just thought that I would throw out there um, the opportunity for anybody who is interested um, to begin uh, compiling uh, demolition updates. Whenever we demolish something, um, we're, we're supposed to notify MHC. And um, I think it's not unusual for a lot of times not to do that. But um, if folks are looking for fun projects to add to their <laughs> historic commission experience, um, I'd be happy to, you can just shoot me an email and I can talk to you about, um, figure out what's required. Um, I know um, somebody at my work was showing me how if you look at macros maps and you know you can sort of, if you, if you have the appropriate underlay, you can actually see um, if the maps are updated enough, you know, where there's, where there's a dot and there's no building anymore, you know, and those can just be reported and um, that helps them update the inventory. Um, so that's just sort of an informational note. Does anybody have any questions or? Okay. Um, Next updates, um, I have the Jones Library interior follow-up and there was also the MHC letter and we're not gonna be discussing either of those at this meeting. Uh, the library expressed a strong interest to be able to be at any meeting where we discuss those things. I just put it on the agenda because um, as part of our discussion with, um, this was in completely separate from the MHC letter, which I'll recuse myself from, but prior to that, when we were having our discussion with the architects, um, we hadn't um, gotten to interior changes, which I think we don't have purview over as part of the preservation restriction, but we certainly could have an advisory role. And when we toured the building, um, a number of us had questions about um, particularly preservation of historic fabric that has to be removed and that sort of thing. So we will um, table that to our next meeting. Um, barn tours and assessment, um, haven't gotten anywhere with that. Um, Nate, is it okay for me to st start to develop a mailing list from the, um, from that outbuilding uh, yeah. report? Start there. Okay. And we can. Yeah, I didn't respond to your email, but I, I think that'd be, would be a good thing to do. Okay. Um, yeah. And for Jones library, just to let everyone know that the, um, yeah, we'd invite the team back, you know, the trustees as well as the architects and consultants and we'd have a discussion about changes to the interior and it would be as robin mentioned it would be an, it, the commission can have an advisory role um, that could um, be provided to the massachusetts historical commission robin would recuse herself uh, due to her current employment so we'd have to either have if the vice chair is not available we'd vote a vice chair or an acting chair for that portion of the meeting um so you know whoever's one of the three here may be uh helping to, to manage that little piece of the meeting. Okay. Um, so then um, Wildwood Cemetery, I just want to let everybody know I met um, with Rebecca Freck, um, who uh, I don't remember her exact title, who's the manager over there. And um, she is working on updating the area <clears> for <throat> Uh, for macros, I don't think, or actually, I think there is no, there is no there area form. Right. Yeah, and um, the form B also for the building, um, the house also needs an update. And so we had a really great, interesting, fun uh, meeting where there's so much to do. And um, <laughs> but um, we kind of agreed on a general strategy. I was gonna, I need to give her some um, editing feedbacks on her uh, area form. Um, the form B needs a full upgrade, which would be um, a great project. Um, I know I talked to Hetty and Madeline about it, um, doing the, the history and a write-up of that. Um, and then there's also the question of the cemetery needs to be mapped. And uh, without going into specifics too much, I could certainly have Rebecca come back and join us for a meeting. Um, they started a fabulous GIS mapping of the cemetery, but there's a lot of work still to be done. And um, I thought that that might be something that members would wanna volunteer with. It's an outdoor activity, walking around and um, and engaging with Rebecca and, and getting all that really important information 
down on paper. So that's just a general overview of our meeting. And uh, maybe we I can talk with her a little bit more about what a site visit might look. Um, and um, at our next meeting, we can follow up and see if we could schedule one for anybody who's interested in, in helping with that project. It's a really, it's a great one. <laughs> yeah, and I was gonna just jump in and say that they received CPA funding, um, it was just a year ago to uh, work on the house. They may come back to do some more um, rehabilitation of the house. It, you know, it's a private cemetery, although there's a lot of history there. And so um, one of the recommendations was to complete some inventory forms and that also could make it eligible to apply for grants and other funding. And so they are following through with that. It's just been, you know, a volunteer effort. I think, I don't know, maybe just Rebecca, <laughs> maybe one of the two other people with the Cemetery Association, but, um, you know, they're really working to do that. And I think that would be a really great thing to, to get completed for them. And then um, it's something that the CPA committee also asked. And so I think they're, they're really trying to, you know, do all the due diligence that's necessary before they seek other funding. And so. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. It, it's a um, it, it's I think it's got potential for a national register nomination. I mean, you know, that's a lot more work and a lot more funding, but certainly getting all these forms up to date, they start it, those need to be um, up to date and up to par in order for a national register nomination to go forward. It is a garden cemetery. There's um, some relationship with, I think, uh, Olmsted's son who took over. Um, they, they did not design the cemetery, but there's, I think, um, uh, letters back and forth talking about different aspects of it and um, a lot of really interesting questions. So it's it's unusual. Garden cemeteries were this movement that I think started about the late, what was it, like the mid 1800s, honey? Um, yeah. Where, yeah. you know, you went. Yeah. Yeah, you went away from these grids to these places, you know, with sort of weaving trails and and the idea was that they were, you know, kind of recreational and and um, uh, horticultural as well as cemeteries. Um, so, um, yeah, it's actually it was a really interesting story because it Central Park, which is Olmsted's claim to fame, is inspired by English cemeteries which were sort of picturesque in terms of their landscaping design with monuments in them and so that became the model for Central Park and then the Central Park phenomenon you know kind of re-infused this sort of very romantic idea of landscape and re recreation in in cemeteries in this country um and there are many that are on the National Register. I can think of a few off the top of my head, but um, it would be really great to see that kind of recognition given to Wildwood Cemetery, because it's, again, a very important site in terms of Amherst history. Yeah, and I'm and not Amherst sure. College, actually, yeah. too. Yeah, and I think that the, the mapping of, of the graves is actually probably a pretty important part of, I'm not sure, but I would think a pretty important part of mm -hmm. making that national register bar. So that's something that, you know, we could we could help participate with. Okay. Um, going at a good clip here. Public comment for, for our one diligent attendee. <laughs> um, uh, if Hilda has any additional comments, she can raise her hand. Give her a moment. Oh, she has raised her hand. Let's uh, allow Hilda into the conversation. Well, I was just going to send ahead of you a note that Mount Auburn, Mount Auburn is the uh, one we all, uh, I got to, anyway. Oops, we lost her. <laughs> no, I think she's trying to silence her phone. <laughs> yeah, Mount Auburn in uh, Boston. Well, to Belmont. Belmont. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was the uh, the first garden cemetery. So um, yeah, cemeteries at, by themselves are not uh, National Register eligible. Like they, they have to meet certain, all they're always historic, almost always historic. They have to meet certain, a certain higher bar. But um, the fact that the garden cemeteries are a movement um, is what allows uh, uh, something to kind of move up to. National Register status. Hold on, unmute yourself if you have any other comments to uh, 
relay. Okay, well, I'm going to, while we're waiting, I'm going to open up. Anybody have any unanticipated items? Hedy, I think you had some question about a um, Mass Cultural Council funding. I think it can be tabled till the next meeting. It's fine. It's not. Oh, I was going to just say I'd, I'd have to, I looked into it, but I actually don't, um, you know, Amherst has a cultural district uh, that covers the downtown, uh, almost the same boundaries as the business improvement district. Okay. And so, uh I think it, I think it's I don't know for how how um, rigorous the application process is, but you know every year the cultural council is going to apply to the Mass Cultural Council to receive grants for program. It's mostly for programming and okay. events, and okay. so the Amherst Cultural Council Cultural District received fifteen thousand dollars. The state did give out eight hundred fifty thousand dollars across the different cultural districts uh, and, and communities. So they have you know the, for, it seems like they had a large amount of money this. Well, you know, for next whatever fiscal year they gave the money out, but yeah, Amherst had fifteen thousand. I don't think it's for any necessarily preservation efforts. It's I think mm -hmm. it's more for programming. Um, but I can I can get you know more detail if you want. I just have to reach out to the. That would be the, great, mate. I was sort of yeah. I had a few things in mind, like um, wall murals, the number of really amazing pieces of public art we have in town. One of which I know needs to be. Um, redone you know if it's going to survive mm -hmm. um but also maybe programming down the line for things like the mill river trail um obviously i'm jumping the gun at this point but i'm just curious to learn a bit more about that yeah i think it's really i mean i used to um manage the mass cultural council um the local cultural council up in greenfield in this this grant process and um you know so like you said that's like there's you know they had about Fourteen thousand dollars a year, um, small grants to artists and programming, and um, it's a great thing for us to know about. So that, like, for example, when somebody comes to us to, you know, fund a walking tour or something like that, that's uh, that might be related to preservation, but it isn't direct preservation. That's a great place to be able to point them um, for funding and to think about things. And I think the Mill River Trail is a great. Uh, great part of that too. Like they should be made aware of it so that as things come up that they might need funding for. Um, so, okay. Any other, any other unanticipated items? All right, it is 8.08 .08 p.m. Seeing that Hilda's hand is down, <laughs> I'm gonna uh, adjourn this meeting. And, oh, actually, no, wait, before we adjourn, we have to schedule for next month. Do we do that over email so we can get Antonio's schedule information? Um, yeah, actually, that's fine. I can send out a, a poll, um, but let's get some dates for this group so that I have something to pull with, and particularly in terms of what Nate's schedule is. What works well for you, Nate? Well, I think Robin you said Mondays. One Mondays are good for me, like the eight, okay. eight, uh, eighth and fifteenth. Okay. Uh, Anyone not be able to make the eighth or the fifteenth? I am not able to make the fifteenth. That's actually Martin Luther King Day. Ah, so I wouldn't either then. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, we don't have any. Demolition permits coming down the line right now. Not we, can we no. schedule for the eighth just and have the fifteenth as backup? Or the ninth? It's a holiday, so. Oh, the eighth yeah. is. No, the fifteenth is a holiday. Oh. Yeah. Um. The ninth, I can't do. I can't do Tuesdays and Wednesdays right now. Okay. And um, I think that's why we were going for Monday. Should we try, should I pull for the 8th and the 22nd? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds good? Okay. 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 And I think the, um, oh, sorry, just two, a few quick things. I think Robin, I saw your email. We're, we're trying to get um, documentation of the Southeast Street property yep. that was um, allowed to be demolished. There's the three properties owned by Amir Mikchi that we torn down um, 
kind of behind Cumberland. And so we can get out, you know, I, I was waiting for an email response, Robin, but I'll, I'll prompt something tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and then I'm also trying to get a site visit to 45 and 55 South Pleasant Street uh, so for more documentation. So, you know, any member of the commission could go on that. So I'm hoping we could get something soon. Okay. Great. Okay. So uh, with that, I will adjourn our meeting at uh, 8, 11 PM. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.